Hi everyone and welcome to a Sociology of Media Voices series and today we're going to talk about everything photography, image capturing, footprinting, visual, what does that mean? What representation does capturing an image of ourselves mean to us and the rest of those around us? So our special guest today is Marlo and they are an emerging photographer based in Nam, Melbourne. Their work engages with queering identities surrounding embodiment, gender and identity. Through the in-camera editing methods, such as distortion and blur, the artist plays with the troops of photography to reshape such constructs and challenges the natures of perception. By re-imaging the body through photography, Marlowe navigates their own transness and embodiment. An integral part of their photography is connecting with other queer, transgender and gender diverse people as a means to continually challenge transphobia and gender norms. Marlowe has received a Bachelor of Arts Photography and a Bachelor of Fine Arts Honours from, the, from RMIT University. He has also had solo exhibitions at the Trocadrio Art Space in 2021 and No Vacancy Gallery in 2018. They have also exhibited work at Brunswick Street Gallery, Melbourne, Noir Darkroom, Melbourne, and the Meat Market, Melbourne. Without further ado, welcome Marlo to our show. Hello, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for being here. Marlo, tell us a little bit about who is Marlo. Sure. Okay. Um, I'm Marlo. Um, I'm currently living in uh, Melbourne. I'm currently working as a teacher during the day. And I also do a lot of photography, which is why I'm here. I'm very passionate about photography. Photography is a big part of my life. Um, I'm trans, masculine, non-binary, use they, them, he, him pronouns. And yeah, I've been living in Victoria most of my life. And um, I like reading, walking and hanging out with my friends. And that's about it. That's me in a nutshell. So tell us, when did you first gravitated towards the idea of um, image capturing? Sure. Um, I was actually pretty young. Um, I think I was pretty lucky because my mum's an artist and she paints. And so I was always kind of around her when she was painting and we'd go see galleries and things like that. But as much as I loved painting, it didn't really interest me. So I think in high school, she gave me one of her old cameras and I started to... Um, take that around with me like on our trips and things like that and my high school had a dark room and I was really interested in editing the photos with all the different chemicals with like paint brushes and obscuring the camera and getting all these different methods that I could kind of alter the image um, so that's kind of what got me into it I was just really interested in the process and kind of um, abstracting images to try and like um, I don't know challenge how people saw things I suppose and then um, when I kind of started questioning my own gender in my early 20s, I started to use photography in a more like cathartic way, um, taking photos of myself, um, my body, and doing those similar editing techniques where I was shooting through water and glass um, into perspex mirrors to kind of like warp my own body and um, putting things in front of the lens just because I didn't, I guess I didn't feel comfortable in my body. So that was my way of kind of trying to show, you know, the exterior or the interior and the exterior, how I was feeling about my own body. Um, you know, and I guess now that I am out as trans and I'm more, um, I've done things to kind of affirm my gender. Um, I'm using photography, I guess, in a more of a celebratory way in a way to connect with other people, taking um, other queer people's portraits and things like that. Um, yeah, that's, that's kind of the journey, I guess, of photography for me. Mm. And it's interesting how when you were telling your story about, you know, capturing, you know, your perceptions of your body, 
and the schemas that we, we put around um, maleness and femaleness representations in our embodiment. And for me, um, there were times in my early adolescence um, that I saw the camera as a weapon and the weapon was against me because the photos that were taken of me didn't represent who I really was. And it was capturing something that I did not like. And for me, that was, I guess, before in that those days in the in the 70s and 80s, there was no language around transgender or gender dysphoria. But I remembered feeling that disconnect to what the image and the photography, especially for school photos, for a lot of us was complicated. And I'm wondering, is that something in your journey and your studies? that you find that, and I only, as a starting point, that some of us who are trans and gender diverse experiences when we're just emerging identities in school, that the actual school photo mm. is quite dysphoric because it forces us into binary kind of ways of being. Mm. Yeah, that's a really interesting point specifically with the school photos. Um, I, I guess I, I always felt you know, I mean, it's a bit of a cliche, trans cliche. So I always felt different. Like I knew something was different and it wasn't until I had the language, I suppose. But yeah, I always felt kind of uncomfortable in front of, well, being, yeah, my, having my photo taken. So I really, I still feel a bit strange looking at my old school photos. Um, and it is very, um, you know, a very gendered and um, binary, um, I don't know, way at schools like you are everything is gendered at school still um yeah I guess I did feel that way and it reminds me because I, I still do a bit of commercial photography and I take photos at Debs um so they're extremely gendered I mean they're very old school I don't know if you know what they are mm. yeah so that's where my mind went automatically you know you've got the girl and the guy and you take their photos together um yeah, so I always imagine, you know, I, I wonder if there's any gender diverse kids at these events or, you know, maybe they're not there because they are so gendered. Uh, so when you're taking your the photos in that workspace mm. with debutant balls, so from what you're seeing at the, in, say, 2023, there is still that very demarcation between what males are presenting and females are presenting in, in, in the capturing of the so-called debutante, um, I guess, milestone of their lives? Yeah, yeah, extremely. It's extremely, you know, traditional um, gender stereotypes. And the girls are in the big white flowing dresses and all of the guys are in, you know, their suits. And, and you know, I'm a primary school teacher, so I see... It's very gendered at school still, and then their school photos are all coded in that way as well. So, um, you know, and I get asked a lot, you know, are you a boy or a girl? And, you know, I'm more than happy to talk to them and, um, you know, as much as I can because I'm not completely out of school. But, um, yeah, it's just interesting. So, yeah, it is very gendered. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, and it sort of leads on to my next question, which you sort of start to answer, which is the codification of of how people look at young people in schools that it's quite clear that the way young people uh, get their messaging is still through clothes mm. and that must for some of us in the you know who are who are trans and gender diverse growing up um, it's quite a con confronting and sometimes discomforting experience so it for yourself and your journey um, of being a photographer and it must take you to places and spaces when you're capturing imagery what is it that you, when you're taking a photo of someone from say from our community from trans community that makes you connect I guess differently from a, say, a cisgendered person mm. I guess um, and I know trans people are all different we're not all the same but I feel like there's this sort of mutual understanding in terms of how we experience our own body and our gender and kind of what we've had to go through so 
when I do take a lot of, um, when I take portraits of trans and gender diverse people, um, even if I don't, you know, know them well, I do feel like they're a bit more relaxed or I feel a bit more relaxed and we can kind of, um, you know, don't always have to have the trans 101 talk, but we, you know, often because I, it is a very personal experience having a, a photo taken, I feel, often people just kind of open up and will share our own experiences and, um, I feel like, you know, with that, we relax and we get to know each other kind of thing. And, um, yeah, I feel like once someone's relaxed, you can get a really beautiful portrait of someone that, um, I don't know, just feels a bit more honest. And, um, yeah, that's what I, I like about it. And if I can take a photo of um, a trans and gender diverse person that, you know, when they look at it and they just feel really proud and they say, yeah, like, that's me and I love this image because I can see myself, um, and that's kind of what I what I aim for. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I, I don't know if I've taken a photo of a cis person <laughs> recently to compare it with, but um, yeah. Um, does that answer? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 it's taking us to that journey of people, I guess, because there'd be people listening to this and maybe there are researchers sociologists who are made, who are in the media space who are cisgender heterosexual photographers and I'm always interested to see when somebody captures an image or that they are a professional photographer you know how do they see the world you know and what schemas are they constructing around the, the image that they're capturing mm. you know, and how do they codify that with the way the lights getting closer and for me, I wonder too, like, if you can sort of tell us your expertise, has photography changed, you know, from, say, 120 years ago? Mm -hmm. uh, and I've seen some pictures of um, trans uh, people being taken and um, but they've been found, but they were kept. They're obviously done in secrecy. Mm -hmm. Have you ever looked at older pictures of of photos imagery is done of that of of our community um to be honest not many I did look at some um I saw some recently and they um weren't images taken with um uh with um approval and they mm -hmm. were taken against the will of um a trans person trans man um and they he was living as trans um uh, in, secret, in secret he wasn't out and um, I think it, I can't even remember if they were from like 18 or you know early 1900s what it would have been 19 um, and he uh, married his wife and then later I think he was admitted to a, a ward um, for mental health and well maybe because he was outed as trans I can't quite remember but um yeah, so once he was discovered, the media kind of had this frenzy and they started publishing his photos and they'd actually photoshopped um, his, a photo of him and his wife. They'd swapped their faces around and just done all this weird stuff and they'd taken his portrait in the ward without, you know, really his consent. Um, so they're not great images. <laughs> um, I suppose they were pretty, you know, alarming and I just really felt for him and... Um, yeah, so and I think that's what's that's what's so striking because when you mentioned that, you know, the permission aspect, and for many trans and gender diverse people, photography can be quite conflicted in some ways because that element of exposure, mm. and I'm using that double autonomy <laughs> exposure as but uh, but also exposure to the rest of the community, mm. it quite can be quite confronting. Mm. Um, and I'm wondering, is that something that you find when you're taking you're taking photos now of our community that you get questioned or do people say to you, oh, where is this going to or who will get access to it? Is there, I guess, more of a concern? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's um, especially with social media, um, people, you know, have a right to be concerned and I always say look I'm going to show you everything before I put it online or whatever I do with it whether it's putting it up in a gallery and if you ever change your mind that's 100% fine so there's definitely people that have said actually you know don't show this image um, so there definitely is concerns uh, for some people but I also find um, 
that, you know, I do a lot of nude portraiture as well, which is, you know, very a vulnerable thing to do, you know, I do portraiture as well clothed. Um, but I, I feel like because of that, I was thinking about this the other day, I feel like I only kind of get approached or, you know, you get um, people that are interested in my work that are willing to be published online. So it's usually people that are out, maybe they're very vocal or they have um, an online, you know, you know, present social media presence or something like that, where they are living these very like out and proud um, lives. So I often think, are there people, you know, quieter people um, that would like to have their voices heard or have the portrait taken that maybe just aren't, um, you know, approaching photographers and um, yeah, or, you know, rarely get the chance to have their portrait taken or their voice heard. Um, yeah. That's incredible because that's something that I was thinking. Um, we are we are in in our world that we've all been indoctrinated and culture in culture to capture, you know, signpost uh, aspects of our lives, you know. And it is so true that you know there is you know we have photography to capture moments, you know, in those that I know we're in traditional family constellations, you know, when a child is born or when a child, uh, when there used to be marriage between uh, just men and women in, in the, you know, earlier on many years ago, um, and you would have moments of time that were captured and then portrayed onto, I'd say, the walls. And now how things that have moved and shifted in society where there's a great acceptance, yet there is still that element that we're still trying to validate our own existence being and trying to fit in. And it, for me, sometimes it is, it's like you said, it's just, you know, where can we capture? There may be people out there who are doing ordinary jobs and who may not necessarily be public, but still would like to have some sort of connection with themselves and the world around them. And it's interesting. And I guess for me, when I got to meet you and it was around a project that you're doing. And I thought, can you tell us a little bit about this project that you're currently working on? Sure. Um, so the project I'm currently working on, um, I'm hoping to make a photographic book, um, portraits and interviews with older trans and gender diverse people. Um, so it's very early stages at the moment. I've interviewed maybe six people, six older trans and gender diverse people. Um, and then, yeah, I just love to take their portraits and put it into a book. Um, I, I don't remember, to be honest, how or where the thought came from. I think I was thinking of my own relationship with my family and look, I'm, yeah, I'm really lucky. I do have a, a good relationship with them, but like I was saying before, I think with other trans and gender diverse people, there's that kind of mutual understanding. So there's just things that they couldn't, or well, maybe struggle to understand when it comes to my transness um and just you know that and me in general um because that is me um yeah so I, was, I started thinking about that and then I started thinking about um you know the elder trans community and you know where are they and then I started thinking what do I look like in the future and that got me thinking about you know the kind of bridge between younger generations of trans and gender diverse people and older trans and gender, gender diverse people and where is that community where they kind of meet and share their experiences um, and hopefully you know grow from each other and so that was one aspect of it and then I thought you know as I was looking online for different community groups for older trans people um, you know there it's there and old trans people exist but I just thought you know there's, there's obviously a gap because it's very little, like their voices and their faces aren't in the media. Um, so I wanted to kind of create something that would show them um, everyday trans people um, in a positive way where they could just talk about themselves, um, what they're passionate about, and hopefully um, get a portrait of themselves that they are really proud of. Um, that's, yeah, that's it. And I think that's what's so um inspiring about your work because it gives older uh, tr people who are trans and gender diverse 
that moment of their time to to capture and kind of that having a portrait of yourself as yourself and for many of us we didn't affirm ourselves like myself to my late 40s so you do kind of want to think yeah so i can look at something and not have to visualize how i want to be in my mind Mm. because sometimes for many of us we've lived through our imageries, images that we've created artificially in our head to protect ourselves from hurt or not being able to present to the world as we would like to be. Mm. I think for, for some of for many of us, having a portrait as we are um, is an important step of authenticating the journey to affirmation. So that's incredible. Um, experience and, I, and for anyone that's listening who's researching in this space who would like to uh, talk to Marlo as a consultant for their work to reach out to me and I'd be happy to um, follow on their detail pass on their details Marlo it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you today um, I just want to thank you for coming in and sharing your story and the value of photography as a medium and as also a power tool to affirm those of us in the community and especially for Ida Hobbit Day, it's wonderful to celebrate emerging um, creative artists like yourself. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me, Ricky. I really enjoyed it. Thank you.